Good evening. I'm Nev Van Pell, and thank you for joining us. A male was taken to the hospital following a single vehicle collision earlier today on the intersection of Harbor Expressway and Golf Links Road. Emergency services were dispatched to the area just after 11.15 a.m. after reports of a motor vehicle collision. Officials located a male on scene and transported him to the Regional Health Sciences Center. The extent of his injuries is unknown. The traffic unit is involved in the ongoing investigation, and more details will be provided when they become available. A local forestry organization is working to build bridges among Thunder Bay's nature-based nonprofits. The Northwestern Ontario section of the Canadian Institute of Forestry held a networking event recently for local groups working in all aspects of the natural environment. Jonathan Wilson has more. From foresters to conservationists to the hunting and fishing crowd, the Canadian Institute of Forestry's Northwestern Ontario section's Spreading Seeds event brought together local nonprofits from different sectors that connect with nature, inviting them to share a little about their work. Many of you in the room have probably heard of WWF. It's an international conservation organization. We're established in 1933. We're a, a local club. We're based in Thunder Bay. You either know about the LRCA because you like going to Cascades and you've been to Hazelwood or Mills Block and you enjoy the outdoor recreation opportunities, or you know about the Conservation Authority because we told you you couldn't build your house where you wanted to build it. The Institute's past president, Doug Reed, says the goal with the event is to build connections and foster collaboration between disparate organizations working in different ways in the region's natural environment. We have recreation-focused groups, we have conservation-focused groups, we have education focused groups and the common thing is we all care about the forest and we all want to see it thrive and survive for future generations. Reed says he's happy with the turnout with roughly 60 people in attendance including foresters, students and academics, members of the public and of course representatives of several nature-based nonprofits. Uh, managing ecosystems, surveying for species at risk, invasive species, science-based solutions to conservation problems. And how do we use the bark, the branches um, and other biomass? Um, encouraging folks to spend time outside, uh, get that feeling of reciprocity with our living landscape. We all want to enjoy the environment as much as we can and it has to be protected. For the foresters at the Institute, Reed says it's crucial to talk to other stakeholders and understand a diversity of perspectives on the forests they manage. When we think about sustainable forest management in the modern context, it includes not just the extraction of wood, but also the maintenance of ecosystems, the maintenance of recreational values, the maintenance of water quality, all of those things are important. So in order to be effective forest managers, we need to understand these perspectives and understand how to ensure that these other values are being protected. The networking event is part of the effort to expand the scope of the Institute, and Reed hopes it will help attract new members from outside the forestry sector. Jonathan Wilson, TBT News. Matawa First Nations launched their New Beginnings project this past week. It's a web-based 211 directory aimed at people who were formerly incarcerated so they can access supports and services to help them reintegrate into society. The launch event included a demonstration of the directory by policy analyst Paul Majiskin. Organizers say this tool can be crucial for someone trying to locate services such as healthcare, legal support, mental health and addiction treatment, housing and food. Matawa officials say people being released from custody face a lot of challenges. The goal is to help keep them from reoffending and ending up back in correctional institutions. The easy to use tool can be found on the Matawa website along with additional information. It's meant to connect people to service as efficiently and as quickly as possible using the most up to date and current information from and relevant with what is needed in the community. And we're hoping that this provides the services in not the services, but the connections to services. Finding help isn't always the easiest thing. We're hoping this makes it a little bit easier. Matawa officials hopes that shedding light on this tool will show that Thunder Bay is a great hub for services, making it easier for individuals to get the best help possible for what they need. The Ontario Native Women's Association has created a 13-part wellness video series to support Indian residential school survivors and their families. The online video reflects the importance of mental health services, culture reclamation, and wellness to combat the trauma many still feel today. And these videos um, will focus on five main themes. Healing from grief and loss, family connection, uh, restoring safety, 
healthy coping and ongoing mental health strategies. Riche is Anwa's sexual violence awareness training coordinator and he appears in several of the videos. The wellness series recognizes the legacy of residential school system as well as the impact it had on indigenous women and their families. The videos include traditional teachings, meditation tips, switch situational awareness safety, and other wellness supports. Riche says they're proud to be able to help people with these videos. So part of the legacy of, uh, of the residential schools is you know, such a loss of, of culture, of language, of identity. And of course, there was a, a large breakdown in the family that we're continuing to see today. So the videos reflect that. The, the Anwa, everything Anwa does, it has a, a very important part of it is culture and, um, and wellness. So. The Thunder Bay Public Library and the local repair cafe have signed a partnership agreement which commits to having one of the branches host a public repair event every three months. Both parties hope this will provide new ways of bringing the community together for many years to come. Jaden Billick has more. Thunder Bay Repair Cafe was founded in 2022 and has held five free events in various locations across the city. Event goers can bring broken household items to be repaired by volunteers, as well as learn to do the repairs themselves completely free of charge. The overall goal is to reuse these items and reduce unnecessary waste on our planet. Organizer Nancy Saunders says she's very excited for this partnership with the public libraries to facilitate these events. So we've had two of our events at the library already, uh, and that is what led to this partnership. Now we have, uh, up until the end of 2024, we're going to have three confirmed events. It's great because they're accessible uh, to anybody and easy to get to, um, and they have the space that we are looking for to host events. And yeah, they're on board with everything that we're doing, so it's a great fit. The public library's latest strategic plan focuses on collaboration, innovation, and experimentation. Library CEO Richard Togman says this is the perfect partnership as both parties share the same core values. The action of bringing the community together to share knowledge, as well as partnering with local businesses and dedicated volunteers, is a great addition to the library schedule and exactly what the city needs during these tougher economic times. So anything that the library can do to support that is, is something we're going to. So that's why we're very excited for this partnership, a great way to bring people together, you know, learn new skills uh, and, and make an impact so that they're not just bettering, you know, themselves, you know, saving a couple dollars, learning new skills. Um, but this, uh, these social connections people make are the things that make Thunder Bay a fantastic place to live. The first event of the new partnership will be at the Waverly Library on Saturday, April 20th. The following confirmed events will be taking place in July and October with a strong possibility of renewing partnerships for 2025. Jaden Billick, TBT News. This winter's mostly dry weather made it a tough season for local ski hills. But with the recent dump of snow, Mount Baldy officials say they've been, a been able to partially make up for lost time. Jessica Clement has the story. Local skiers and snowboarders couldn't wait to hit the slopes this weekend, wanting to make the most out of the large snowfall earlier in the week. Mount Baldy saw a large crowd on Sunday, with residents flocking to the hill right when it opened. Co-owner Daniel Cardis says the snow the region has seen over the past week has been amazing for the ski hill and its patrons. We won't lie out here, we've been waiting for it all season and it finally came at the end of the season. All I gotta say is thanks up there for all this beautiful snow, end of the season, open Easter, the last couple of days have been uh, Amazing out here. People are definitely enjoying the powder. It's one of those things. We haven't had any snow really realistically all season long. And uh, here we go. It's beautiful white behind us and the conditions can't get any better. Most of Mount Baldy's runs are open, except a couple on the far side of the mountain. Cardis says this weekend's been a huge change compared to the last few weeks. Basically a couple weeks ago you've seen tumbleweed going down the road and and now the you know the lineups of the cars and the people are coming and they're enjoying it. But uh, uh, it's, it's amazing what it does. It really sparks everyone. When you look outside your, your front door and you see green grass, it's, there's no motivation there to come out to come and ski, right? So uh, once it snows, boom, everyone's like, hey, let's get out there and, and, and enjoy it. Friday, it was fantastic. It was the way the ski hill should be all winter. Like tons of kids, tons of families, everybody doing their thing. It, it was amazing. Cardis notes that Mount Baldy plans on remaining open for at least a couple more weeks, as long as the snow sticks around. Usually this time of season, I'm, I'm jet-setting, jumping on a plane, going somewhere hot or somewhere back to the mountains, but uh, 
the season I'm sticking around and I'm going to go for the gusto here and see what happens. We started early. We were making snow, believe it or not, in uh, October uh, October 21st and uh, open November 1st. So it's definitely been a long season. It's been a hard one with no snow all season, but uh, this end of the season snow is, is uh, a blessing for us and uh, we're just enjoying it. Updates on Mount Baldy can be found on their social media pages and website. Jessica Clement, TBT News. We're now joined by sports anchor Vasilios Bellos. Weird seeing you on the sports side. It feels side. a little weird. It's <laughs> weird seeing that's usually my chair. Keep it warm for me. Keep it safe. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but the local SIJHL teams yep. absolutely crushing it in the playoffs so looking far. Looking fantastic that first round. Of course, we know the North Stars already through with a sweep. The Cambria River Fighting Walleye looking to do the same thing last night. We'll have the full highlights after the break.